Hey everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today we'll be watching History Summarized Byzantine Empire, The Golden Age by Overly Sarcastic Productions. Last time we saw the beginnings of the Byzantine Empire, and today we will be heading into a whole new era of Byzantine history. I'm excited to get into that, but before I do, I'd appreciate it if you guys would check out my Patreon. It is linked down below, and it will give you access to exclusive reaction content. Alright, with all of that out of the way, let's jump right into this reaction. The Byzantine Empire has long maintained a delicate balance of simultaneously doing fantastic mm. and also being constantly in peril. Yeah. Normally, this would be a contradiction, but the Byzantines made Golden Disaster Empire their entire damn brand. Yeah, I would say this is very true. You know, the Byzantine Empire has a lot of ups, a lot of downs, and oftentimes those ups and downs are somehow occurring at the same time. <laughs> when you look at Byzantine history, there are usually a lot of positives, a lot of negatives, both of which are substantial occurring at the very same time. It manages to be an empire in decline <laughs> since its founding, if you consider its founding the fall of Western Rome. You know, overall, it's in sort of decline though it had some brief upward momentum, and yet it is still quite powerful. It is a seriously powerful empire in the Mediterranean region and beyond. So, you know, a very interesting, fascinating empire, I would say. As we'll see over the next 500 years, the Dark Ages brought some genuinely mm. brilliant reforms, while the Golden Ages endured some catastrophic failures. Yeah. But just like the Romans of old, the Byzantines kept on keeping on despite the odds and earned their place as one of the longest lasting empires in history. Very so, true. To see how the Byzantines survived the Middle Ages and gained their golden reputation, let's do some history. When last we left our purple-robed friends, the entire southern half of the empire had been swiftly yoinked by the shiny new Muslim <laughs> caliphate, and within a century, these new neighbors had landed on Constantinople's doorstep on two separate occasions. Yeah, and if you remember, and this sort of relates to the ups and downs of the Byzantine Empire, what we saw in the last episode, we started with the fall of Western Rome. Of course, this is a low point for the Roman Empire as a whole. Then we reach Justinian. He accomplishes great things. He reclaims a lot of that lost territory. Oh, the Byzantine Empire's on the up and up. Then Justinian dies. Everything starts to decline again. We reach the Caliphate. Oh no, yeah, the Byzantine Empire's bottoming out again. <laughs> there you go. You have those numerous ups and downs. At the moment, not doing too great, but I sense we have a recovery coming only to be repelled by the very fires of hell itself. See, the Byzantines had a little trick called Greek fire, a mm. secret substance that could be shot from a siphon at an incoming navy and burn down everything from the mast to even the water. But that's not all the Byz- Yeah, and it's my understanding that even today, we still don't completely understand Greek fire. You know, like there are a couple pieces missing to where we still don't really get it today. Byzantines had learned from the fall of Rome. In addition to their functionally impenetrable Theodosian walls, they maintained hundreds of underground cisterns to fortify their water supply. Yeah. No city on earth was better defended than Constantinople. So true. Those Theodosian walls, my goodness. The amount of times they protected the city of Constantinople, the people of Constantinople, and of course, the government, the emperor of the Byzantine Empire, from attack, from sieges, is truly remarkable. Without those Theodosian walls, you can pick a whole lot of times when the empire probably would have completely fallen. So, yeah, those Theodosian walls really did their job for a very long time. Of course, in the long run, no walls are impenetrable, but... Hey, they were pretty close to impenetrable for, we're talking hundreds and hundreds of years. But the same thing couldn't be said for the Byzantine provinces, as the Muslim armies were having their run of the place all the way up yeah. into Anatolia. It was only in 740 that Emperor Leo III finally held the Eastern Line, and his son Constantine V fortified the other problematic frontier by pushing back against the Bulgarians in the West. Hey, so Bulgaria mention. So last time, at the end of the video, we had mention of the Slavs who were, you know, moving into the Balkans, settling, and becoming a permanent force in the region. Now we have the Bulgarians. And the Bulgarians in particular are worth mentioning because, you know, if we look over the next couple hundred years, at times, you will have a very powerful Bulgarian empire, sometimes juxtaposed with a rather weak Byzantine empire. So the Bulgarians held a lot of sway, 
and they will be pretty important to the future of Byzantine history. So it took a century and a half there, but hey, credit where it's due, that's a pretty solid recovery. There you However, go. However, there's a more literal reason that this stretch is considered the Dark Ages, and it has to do with icons. Ah. The Byzantines were a rather artistic bunch, and they loved to have images of Jesus, Mary, and friends in their churches and in their homes. Mm -hmm. But in the eyes of people like Emperor Leo, this was beginning to look a lot like idolatry, where- Yes. So we have the whole iconoclasm controversy. There's a lot to say about this, and we discussed in the last episode this idea of your emperor getting involved in Christian religious matters. We saw how much of a time-tested tradition this was. The emperor often got involved in these sort of things. So iconoclasm, you know, the idea that these images are becoming venerated when the images themselves shouldn't be venerated, it is the people behind them. You know, Jesus. Jesus is the one we should be praying to, we should be venerating, not this icon. That's idolatry. That's not Christian at all. And so you get this big debate between the two sides of, well, are these icons becoming a problem? Should we get rid of them? Or, no, these icons are just an image of Jesus uh, and Mary. They just help us worship them more. Where images are worshipped more piously than even God. His right. response, simple enough, was to smash every last image he could get his hands on. Yep. So, starting in 726, he and his fellow iconoclasts destroyed every mosaic, fresco, statue, and... And of course, you know, if you separate yourself from the political and religious debate of the time, and just look at it from our perspective, this creates a bit of an issue for historians, <laughs> because a lot of these murals, these icons, these images are pretty important historical primary sources that are being destroyed, and therefore we don't have them today. So it's like, you know, whatever your religious opinion is on icons, I always think it's unfortunate when these sort of things are destroyed, because, well, first off, there are some great works of art, and second off, that means we have less primary sources to deal with when we're, you know, studying the history doodle in sight. Constantine V eventually doubled down and even began persecuting the clergy for spurring this apparent idolatry. Meanwhile, across the Adriatic, the Pope in Rome was justifiably horrified, and mm -hmm. Byzantine Ravenna took the occasion to declare independence, which is why their mosaics are some of the few to actually survive this mess. Yeah. After Constantine died, his wife Irene called a council to outlaw iconoclasm, but Emperor Leo V reinstated it, and then eventually Empress Theodora re-outlawed it for good in 843. Yeah, we sort of go back and forth with the whole iconoclasm thing, and you can start to see how beef begins to form between the Western Church, you know, the Latin Church, and the Eastern Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church. You know, uh, there are many disagreements to come in the future, but you can sort of imagine how over the span of hundreds of years, a lot of these disagreements start to add up. And there's also a question amongst historians and researchers of how serious was this whole iconoclasm thing? You know, was it really this defining society impacting controversy where every icon you saw was destroyed, people were fearful of keeping icons in their homes, or was it more of a top-level thing? Like, look, take the icons out of the churches and public spaces and we'll be fine. You know, we don't entirely know how pervasive iconoclasm was, but it's certain that it was influential, and we can see how the debate went back and forth over time, especially within, you know, the higher ranks of the court and the church. The final rules were that statues are no bueno, but all 2D art was <laughs> chill, so the Byzantines got back to work with gorgeous frescoes and mosaics. Greek art would proceed to snub visual realism in favor of more stylized figures, with enough gold decoration to give a Protestant a seizure, and that style <laughs> governs Eastern Orthodox art to this day. Yeah. So while I weep on a weekly basis for how pathetically few pieces of original art survived iconoclasm and the Ottomans, the dreaded double whammy, I yeah. can take comfort knowing that the Byzantine style has well over a thousand years of continuity. But yeah, it is a shame. Like I said, regardless of your perspective on any of these issues, I think it's always a shame when these historical sources, these pieces of art, don't survive. And of course, we've lost historical sources for a whole bunch of reasons, so that's always a shame. But it is cool to see this particular style, the continuity over time, 
and how sort of iconically Byzantine it is. But for all the damage the iconoclasts did to art, they made some crucial reforms to the Byzantine military and government by, well, making them the same thing. Yep. See, back in the old Imperial Roman days, the provinces had no innate defenses, and they had to wait for the legions to show up from Jupiter knows where. <laughs> Clearly, that model didn't work anymore. Yeah, and you know, that wasn't necessarily an issue when you had a big, prosperous, powerful empire. <laughs> but as time goes on, the empire begins to weaken, central authority weakens, and you're experiencing threats from all sides, threats from outside and within the empire, it becomes very easy for these provinces to be attacked, to fall away, or even declare their own autonomy from the empire. This was one of the big issues of sort of the late unified Roman Empire, and that's why we saw a lot of these, you know, quote-unquote campaigning emperors like Aurelian, who spent their entire reign campaigning around the empire trying to secure the provinces. So this had been an issue, and as you can imagine, the Byzantine Empire was dealing with an even more different situation than the unified Roman Empire had been dealing with, and so with that, you know, you got to adapt over time. You need to change military and civil administration to better suit the circumstances you're dealing with at the moment. Or so the Byzantines reconfigure their armies and their provinces to fit. In the 6 and 700s, the provinces were gradually redrawn as themata, with the governor taking on the additional role of strategos and overseeing mm -hmm. both the civic and the military care of his thema. And in place of the old-fashioned imperial legions, Byzantine themata each had their own army, staffed with citizens from that specific thema and Exactly. So, thema, or we might call them in English, themes, these different provinces. The Empire just does not have the resources or administration to centrally drop massive armies to deal with issues whenever they emerge. And so, what you do is you break your Empire down into themes, and they have their own independent administration, independent armies, and so they can ideally deal with problems independently, or at least somewhat independently, and that sort of takes some of the burden off of the centralized government. It is a better way of dealing with things if you're dealing with a weakened and reduced empire, which is what we're dealing with now. I mean, that is the story of the Byzantine Empire. Like I said, over time, there is a pretty serious decline, and of course, it is far smaller and has far less resources than it did in the days of the unified Roman Empire, and so it has to adapt to that, and this is one of the biggest examples of that uh, adaptation funded by land grants within that thema, so every soldier had a tangible stake in the well-being of the empire. Though the empire yep. did shrink- And over time, you do develop this sort of elite landed aristocracy, these very powerful landowners who held a lot of power in their particular theme, and you can sort of imagine how that might arise from this system. To about half its size between 6 and 800, the extremely perilous eastern border yeah. <laughs> went from being an unmitigated disaster zone to a fortress. The Byzantines were stronger and safer than ever thanks to the Thema reforms. Yeah. So that's the big picture swerve, but the tactics and composition of the Byzantine army also got an upgrade. Mm -hmm. While infantry remained a staple, the Byzantines kept up with trends by remodeling the old Roman legionary into the fancy new scutatoi. Namely, they ditched the scutum for the hotness that is the kite shield, which explains why the name Scutatoi literally means shield boys. And there to support <laughs> our favorite shieldy boys were the Toxotai archers, but the biggest and the baddest unit in the Byzantine army was the cataphract. Yes. These guys were basically hoplites on horses, with the steed and the rider decked out head to hoof in scale armor. The name technically means fully armored, but I personally prefer to translate it as full metal cavalry. Cataphracts were first introduced as a counter to the Arabic cavalry, which otherwise ran circles around the port of yeah, and to me, it's a, a little bit reminiscent of maybe your Persian heavily armored cavalry. Not to say it's directly drawn from that, but perhaps there's an influence, or perhaps you can see how they would evolve under similar conditions. You know, we have the Eastern Roman Empire, they have their own unique issues to deal with that perhaps a heavily armored cavalry would be better suited to dealing with defenseless scutatoi, but eventually the cataphracts became the core of the Byzantine army and a byword for Byzantine power. Infantry and archers would weaken an enemy's line, and then the cataphracts would swoop in to hammer through the weak points and just shatter the enemy's formations. GG. 
And as an empire that's about 75% coast, the Byzantines had ports to protect on all sides, in the Aegean, along the Mediterranean, and on the Black Sea, so they maintained a pretty beefy navy. In the world's best case of why mess with perfection, the Byzantines still used a version of the Trireme some hey. 2,000 years later as their primary ship. The Dromon, as it became known, had been upgraded with a lateen sail and got absolutely loaded with catapults and ballistae. Plus, instead of simply ramming into enemy ships like some ancient Athenian doof, the Dromoi were equipped with spurs to smash enemy oars and immobilize them for ease of burning and or boarding. Mm -hmm. Slick upgrade. Unfortunately, the navy wasn't quite enough to stop repeated Muslim incursions into nope. Crete, Sicily, and Sardinia. Yeah, the Byzantine Empire still struggled to navally hang on to the Mediterranean. As you can see, a lot of these islands, the prominent islands of the region, are seized by the Caliphate. And I'm not sure if we're gonna get to sort of military strategy, but there is this military manual called the Strategicon, the sort of Byzantine military manual um, that in many ways sort of characterizes this era of Byzantine history, characterizes the new type of strategy to be used in this era of Byzantine history. A lot more focused on conserving resources, a lot more defensive. Once again, all these adaptations to this new era of Roman history. But they dutifully protected the mainland coasts, the islands of the Aegean, and the many trade routes that passed through Constantinople via the Bosphorus River. Yep. With iconoclasm over and the empire no longer teetering on the edge of total collapse, the Byzantines entered two centuries of prosperity and relative peace. Huh. Starting with Basil I, who I really can't help but picture as just a leaf, a line oh. of Macedonian emperors <laughs> guided the Byzantine Empire through its golden yes. age, the peak of imperial prestige and of its cultural influence abroad. Yes, the Macedonian dynasty, the Macedonian empires. We come upon an era of Byzantine strength and prosperity, at least relative to some of the other eras we've seen. <laughs> With the Muslim armies to the east more or less handled, the Byzantines turned their attention to the Bulgarians. There we go. A clever mix of hey, I mentioned the Bulgarians earlier, and here we have, as you can see, a pretty prominent, powerful, and large Bulgarian empire that now the Byzantines have to contend with. And there really is a back and forth between the two. Uh, overall, like I said, the Byzantine Empire will remain, you know, dominant uh, until it's not, <laughs> of course. But there is a back and forth. Religious diplomacy to pacify them via conversion to Christianity. Yeah, and that's a very good point. You know, I've been sort of referring to the military competition between the two. But if you want to look at where the Byzantine Empire really wins, where it's really dominant, it is in diplomacy, culture, and religion. It sort of brings Bulgaria into its own cultural sphere. Bulgarians convert to Christianity, and there is, you know, some tension between the Byzantines and the Western Church, the Catholic Church, over, oh, well, which version of Christianity will they convert to, Eastern or Western? They end up converting to Eastern Orthodox Christianity, which, like I said, really brings them within the Byzantine cultural sphere, and so that may not be, you know, we might call that soft power, right? You have hard power, which might be the size of your military conquering other lands. And we have soft power, a softer form of influence that might come through diplomacy and culture and religion. And the Byzantine Empire was pretty damn good at soft power. They did the same thing with Tsar Vladimir of the Kiev yeah, exactly. Rus, which set early Russia with its quasi-Greek Cyrillic alphabet and its Byzantine-leaning brand of Eastern Christianity. In yep. return, Vladimir hooked the Byzantines up with the Varangian Guard, a legendary band of Scandinavian mercenaries who served as the Emperor's royal guard for centuries. Mm -hmm. Now, this was no Pax Romana, so the Byzantines still had to fight on many- No. No, this is, if you think back, this is a big departure from the Pax Romana this era of power and prosperity that the Roman Empire had. At this point, we're talking hundreds and hundreds of years ago. I mean, the Roman Empire was truly dominant, had no real competitors except at times for the Persians. The Byzantines have a lot of competitors. <laughs> also, they are more a regional power at this point, but they hold a lot of influence and they are sort of the dominant regional power at this point. That may not always be the case, but they are doing very well given these new circumstances. And we talk about the Kievan Rus converting to Orthodox Christianity. Of course, that will have big consequences down the line. I mean, if we think about the history of Orthodox Christianity, uh, 
especially after the fall of Constantinople to the Ottoman Empire, Russia will really become sort of the representative of Orthodox Christianity. And so this has big, big consequences in the future. He fronts, and the Bulgarians even swiped northern Greece in the 900s, later recovered by the Herculean efforts of Emperor Basil II a century later, but... Yep, we, a lot of Basil II fans. Look at all that territory he reconquers. Compared to the way that things were, the Byzantines were doing great. Exactly. Meanwhile, Constantinople had never been better. By 1000 AD, it held half a million people and remained the largest, best defended, and most magnificent city in the world. Hagia Sophia was one of countless churches to get gorgeous new decorations after iconoclasm. And times clearly changed, but Constantinople remained a beautiful window into the classical world. With Absolutely. And, you know, I, I totally agree with the point they're making. It's like, sure, if you compare the Byzantine Empire of this era to the Pax Romana, it's not nearly as impressive. But, considering all that has happened, it's more fair to compare the Byzantine Empire to its more recent history. And compared to that, it is doing exceptionally well. And Constantinople was this extremely impressive city. I mentioned in the last episode how, you know, there were a lot of pilgrims or diplomats or travelers who came to Constantinople, and they were extremely impressed by the Hagia Sophia. I mean, it was this amazing Christian church that they really saw as a testament to God. They were extremely impressed by it, but... They were also impressed by the entire city. As they're pointing out here, Constantinople was a real look into the classical world, a real look into ancient history that was really hard to find. Constantinople was still this sort of, you know, of course, in some ways classical style, in some ways a little more uh, medieval, <laughs> but... I do think it was a look into this impressive, big, prosperous, classical-style city that was pretty hard to find, or maybe impossible to find, on that scale anywhere else. Of course, there were other cities that were rising up, but Constantinople truly had this continuity over time that made it feel like a look into the past. With Roman-style churches, a cartoonishly huge chariot stadium, and marble as far as the eye could see. And yeah. all across the empire, Byzantine architects were hard at work building gorgeous urban cathedrals and cliffside monasteries. But funnily enough, our best looks at peak Byzantine art come not just from outside the empire, but from its rivals. Yeah. To the west, Venice and the Normans made for some of Constantinople's oddest frenemies, because much as they used spears and ships to snag some Byzantine power and prosperity for themselves, they were the most enthusiastic adopters of the Byzantine style. This is absolutely true. We often think about these powers in competition. The Byzantines and the Normans, the Byzantines and Venice, and they absolutely were in competition. We often think of them as belonging to sort of separate cultural spheres, of course within the European Christian world, but separated. But, as they're pointing out, and as I sort of pointed out earlier, Byzantine culture was so influential perhaps further than you might have expected. It had a lot of soft power. And so, you know, these other European civilizations, the Normans, the Venetians, etc., they really drew a lot on Byzantine culture, Byzantine art, Byzantine architecture. Uh, and like OSP is pointing out, a lot of the best examples of Byzantine-style architecture, Byzantine-style art, are found from outside the Byzantine Empire, which is pretty remarkable. I mean, we talked about in the last episode that famous mural of Justinian, um, you know, uh, that came from the Italian peninsula, and it still survived, and that's why we can see it today. So, interesting stuff. Seriously, between St. Mark's Basilica and the Palatine Chapel, Italy is the best place to see Golden yeah. Age art. Then, of course, there's the way the Ottomans co-opted the Byzantine aesthetic, but whoo that is a problem for later. Cool. That's a whole other question. That's getting into a whole new era of history. And that's why, by the way, <laughs> when we talk about this Byzantine-style art and architecture, we're better looking at Italy. Uh, because, of course, the Byzantine Empire was succeeded by another great empire, the Ottoman Empire, that had its own architectural style, its own art, did things its own way. And so you can imagine how that sort of gets in the way <laughs> of us trying to look at all of the Byzantine stuff. Culturally, things had never been better, but politically, the cracks in the proverbial mosaic were starting to show. The Byzantines had been steadily reaching back out to the Balkans and out of Anatolia, but the empire was much more comfortable being on the defensive than the offensive oh, absolutely. at this point, and the carefully constructed Themata system began suffering from bloat. Strategoi got complacent and ignored 
ignored their civic duties to play Monopoly men within their Thema ends between- yeah. But what if I were to seize my soldier's land and disguise it as my own estate? And I sort of mentioned this earlier, you start to see the rise of these very powerful landowners within these themes. And that is especially in this era, with the expansion of the empire, the prosperity, the bloat that we're seeing, that leads to the empowerment of the sort of local landowners, uh, and they do become very powerful. And also, as they pointed out, I really do think the Byzantine Empire was much more comfortable on defense than on offense, or at least sort of maintaining the status quo. When they start to expand, they get, you know, they're on the offense, things start to sort of slip out of their control. We t I talked about the Strategicon earlier, uh, the sort of Byzantine military manual, and like I said, it was far more geared towards a defensive style of warfare, and I really do think that the philosophy of the Byzantine Empire was far more defensive in nature. In Theodosian walls and gold-covered domes, cushy bureaucrats in Constantinople barely raised their heads from their books. Yeah. So each camp blamed the other for the empire's problems, and both did exactly nothing to fix it. The emperor, for his part, didn't help matters by completely ignoring the Themata and relying more and more on the Tagma, a standing army yeah. meant primarily for campaigning. This put the Byzantines in an extremely precarious situation, spread way too thin and poorly prepared to face new threats, like trying to stab <laughs> your enemies with a limp spaghetti. <laughs> yeah. And you know what's interesting is that the Byzantine court is really a look into an earlier era. I mean, when you look at the sort of intellectual nature of it, all the educated people, all the literature, the court politics, now, to a certain extent, this was happening elsewhere, but it takes a pretty prosperous and powerful empire to have that sort of disconnected court culture. You know, if we look at a lot of the rest of Europe following the collapse of the Western Roman Empire, a lot of these new states that emerged, well, they were based around the military. They had military warrior courts. You know, they were based around military elites. Just the fact that the Byzantines still had this sort of civil intellectual elite is pretty remarkable, and you can see similar stuff in the Caliphate at certain points, or in the Muslim world, it also had this very uh, intellectual culture. Uh, of course, for both empires, it depends what time you're looking, <laughs> how strong the empire is at that point, but it is something interesting to point out, and you do start to see this tension and conflict between, you know, the central Byzantine court and the these provincial power holders. To the west, the Normans swooped into southern Italy to conquer the last little Byzantine pockets, and to the east, the Seljuk Turks dunked on the Byzantines yeah. so badly that Anatolia just disappeared. And they yep, and look at that. Yeah, you, the Seljuk wave. The Seljuk Turks roll in from the east, and they completely barrel over, I mean, not just the Byzantines, but they <laughs> barrel over a lot of Byzantine territory, including basically all of Anatolia. They didn't even have to try that hard to do it. Half the Byzantine army deserted en route to the Battle of Manzikert in 1071, and the generals made a series of miscalculations on their way to an entirely avoidable outcome. Yeah, and Manzikert was this pretty significant battle of the era, um, and a pretty significant battle in the Seljuk takeover of this region, right? And the Byzantines sort of losing their footing. By 1075, the empire had never been smaller or weaker. You'd hope that the Greeks would know a little thing or two about hubris, but apparently not. <laughs> nope. And unfortunately for- No, come on. This is the Roman Empire. <laughs> it's very different from the previous Roman Empire, but the Roman Empire always thinks itself the best and most unchallenged civilization on the planet. <laughs> so they always get too comfortable when the going is good. <laughs> Grec boys here, the Ten Hundreds only frayed the already dodgy relationship between the churches in Constantinople and Rome. Justinian's big shiny idea of one church and one empire went kaput as soon as the southern half of the Mediterranean went poof, yeah. and Byzantine authority in Rome remained only nominal at best. When the papal states- Look, Justinian was an ambitious guy, but uh... And some of his ideas were truly influential and did pan out in the long term, his legal code. I mean, the Hagia Sophia. But a lot of his most ambitious ideas, especially about territorial conquest, did not pan out in the long term. <laughs> 
Rifts officially split in 754 was only a formality. Communication between East and West was already tricky because of how few Byzantines spoke Latin and how few Romans spoke Greek. Yeah, and once again, you have the development of this split between East and West. We talked about some of the uh, religious controversies. You also have now a language difference. The West, the Western Church in particular, continues to speak Latin. And the Eastern Roman Empire, at one point, you know, go back a while, they spoke both Latin and Greek, but at this point, they're speaking entirely in Greek, and there reaches a certain point where they don't even really respect Latin speakers anymore, which is funny because, you know, that is the original language of the Roman Empire, so we have a split in language, we have a split in terms of religion, of course, there's just a distance between them, especially as uh, the Byzantine Empire starts to lose more and more territory within Italy, it becomes more and more difficult for the Byzantine Empire to exert influence uh, from Italy westwards, right? I mean, they just don't have the power anymore. Their empire is centered around Constantinople. The closer to Constantinople, the easier it is to exert their influence. And so, you know, the Western Church, the Pope, uh, the Pope in Rome gets more and more powerful. The Pope has more and more influence. And the Pope becomes less and less beholden to the Byzantine Emperor. It is a process that takes a long period of time. And like they said, the, you know, official split is more just a formality. Plus, tiffs like iconoclasm exacerbated disagreements about whether the Pope had supreme spiritual authority or whether the Byzantines had the right to mind their own business. Yeah. These views were fundamentally incompatible, and this multi-century spat came to a head when a Roman delegate excommunicated the entire Byzantine <laughs> church in the middle of Hagia Sophia in the middle of mass. Yep. Damn. So the Greeks responded with excommunications of their own, and <laughs> just like that, we've got a schism. While nobody at the time quite recognized the implications, this marked the final split of ties between the Catholic Church in Rome and the Eastern Orthodox Church. Yeah, I, and I do think at that point it would be very difficult to see the true implications of this. Now, of course, even at the time you would realize that this was a big problem. <laughs> but I imagine, let's say from a Byzantine perspective, because that's sort of what we're doing, you would still see the church essentially as one thing. And I imagine that you would still think over time it would come back together, or you would probably view it as over time the Byzantines would gain, or yourselves, the Romans, would gain control over the entirety of the Christian church. That, of course, is not what happened. <laughs> But one Byzantine emperor saw this as a rare opportunity. Alexios I ended nearly a decade of civil war to assume the throne in 1081, and his Komnenoi dynasty oversaw a remarkable yes. revival of Byzantine fortunes through the 1100s. Yeah. He held the empire steady for nearly four decades, made new trade agreements with the Venetians, and... Yeah, this is one of those dynasties. You know, you have great dynasties in a variety of ways. Some great dynasties reign during great times, reign during eras of prosperity. Some great dynasties are great because they pull the state back from absolute ruin, and that's what we're seeing here. And hatched a clever plan to regain Anatolia. He went to Pope Urban with the offer to recognize papal supremacy in exchange for a dispatch of soldiers to help with the Byzantine reconquest. Yep. But Urban's hearing was a little selective, because he <laughs> ended up sending along several armies worth of European bandits who wanted to, let me make sure I'm reading this right, retake the Holy Land. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, so the actual crusades that happened went, I think, very differently from what the Byzantines had initially expected and had initially wanted. And over time, there will be a lot of negative consequences that come with this. But I still think it's sort of an interesting political play to turn west, turn to the Latin church and try to use them in order to regain some of your eastern territory, because you know you can't do it yourself. Well, that wasn't the plan at all. <laughs> all right, so now Alexios had to wrangle this box of oops all crusaders and point them towards Jerusalem. So and Alexios, he was a cunning fellow. He's a very intelligent leader. I really do think if you could use one word to describe him, it would be, you know, cunning or intelligent. He knew how to play the game of politics, and he was in a very, very vulnerable position. Now, the First Crusade, that one did not go disastrously for the Byzantines, at least not compared to future Crusades, but 
it was still a dangerous time. He still had armies of these Latin Christians within his territory that he had to maneuver around and make sure that they didn't turn on him. And he did a pretty remarkable job of playing that political game and managing to uh, take something from it, right? Managing to earn back some of that Byzantine territory, even though, <laughs> as pointed out, the crusade was didn't go initially how he expected. They didn't go crusading all over his empire instead. Exactly. Unsurprisingly, the crusaders were much more excited to conquer their own lands than to bother restoring lost Byzantine territories, and subsequent crusades would only entangle the Byzantine- Yes, yeah, subsequent crusades would go way worse, and especially way worse for the Byzantines. It's ...further into the mess that is medieval European politics and earned them nothing but antagonism from their western neighbors. Yeah. Meanwhile, the Normans were constantly poking and prodding into Greece, and soon enough the Venetians had a monopoly on Byzantine trade. But despite all that, the Komnenoi left the empire a lot better than they first got it, yeah. having reclaimed coastal Anatolia... That's why I say, you know, the Byzantine Empire is dealing with a lot of issues at this point, a lot of outside threats, uh, especially, frankly, a lot of outside threats from the West, <laughs> from their fellow Christians, but, you know, their Latin Catholic Christian allies at times, rivals at times. But this dynasty, it did sort of bring the Byzantine Empire back from the brink, did secure it, at least to a certain extent. Like I said, one of those dynasties made great, not because they ruled during a time of great prosperity, but because... They managed to rescue the Empire from what could have been a terrible fate, and, well, what eventually will be a terrible fate. Modernized the economy by Venetian supervision, and continued to make church loads of gold-covered art. Honestly, I feel like that's kind of the Byzantine motto at this point. Yeah. Definitely precarious, but hey, it could have been a lot worse. And <laughs> yeah. we'll find out how this eternally perilous situation resolves in part three, but for now, let's recap. When we picked up this chapter of Byzantine history, the Oh my goodness! Look at that, 555 AD. Yeah, in some ways, looks more like a unified Roman Empire than it does a, you know, in decline Byzantine Eastern Roman Empire. That's where we began. <laughs> Empire was in a really bad way, what with the hemorrhaging Ooh. provinces and smashing and then all look of at their that. <laughs> and it's not an accident that they went on to steady their empire and revitalize their culture. The Byzantines survived Ooh. and then dug themselves Ooh. out of the Dark Ages by being clever and not giving up. The thing yeah, it's funny, you know, we look at the empire at this point and it's like, oh, look how shrunken down and weak it is. But, you know what? had been shrunk. It was a lot smaller, but it was steady. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was pretty secure at this point. And frankly, a lot of the issues start emerging when the empire starts to expand again. You know, bloat emerges. It gets a little too big for its own good. It struggles to deal with that expansion. System is a genius innovation in statecraft, and it bought the Byzantines an entire golden age to work with. And of course, as time went on, they got a little careless, but when things got right. dire, they persevered and turned things around yeah. again. I don't just- I, I really do think that is you know, Roman more broadly, but especially as they pointed out, the Byzantine motto, the Byzantine way of doing things, is that, you know, as with the Roman Empire, you know, usually, when times are going well, they get a little complacent, and then they run themselves into some sort of disaster. But when they hit that disaster, when they bottom out, they toughen up, they adapt, and they manage to survive. Just like Byzantine history in spite of their setbacks, I love Byzantine history because they're a golden disaster empire, <laughs> damn yeah, it. Remember, same. in life, it doesn't matter how you get knocked down, or how you lose all of North Africa, <laughs> or all of Greece, or Ooh, Anatolia, too. Yeah. Jeez, those guys have really been through a lot. Yeah, that's what tough. Matters, <laughs> what matters... The, the long-suffering Byzantine Empire <laughs> is a way you could describe it. <laughs> ...is that you keep on trying no matter what, because golden ages can dawn when you least expect it. Wow. Thank you so truly, much for watching. Story truly a beautiful point. Alrighty, um, I really enjoyed this video. You know, I point this out every time we do an OSP reaction, but it's worth pointing out. Uh, I really enjoy these overly sarcastic productions videos. Uh, I'd like to do more of them in the future, frankly. Some of you have suggested some, you know, uh, non-Roman OSP history videos, and I think I would definitely like to do those at some point. So far, I've only done OSP videos on Rome. In fact, we've been going through them basically chronologically, and I've really, really enjoyed them. You know, they're just 
really good at presenting the history in a interesting, fun, and accessible way. You know, these videos are not super long, but I do feel like they managed to pack a lot of the important themes into a pretty short amount of time. And I also really appreciate their perspective on the history. Uh, I feel like it really aligns with my own, uh, at least on the Roman history. That's all I've really done from them. But when it comes to Roman history, and, you know, of course, this is Roman history, Eastern Roman, Byzantine history, whatever you want to call it, uh, I certainly agree with a lot of the conclusions drawn, and I really appreciate their manner of presenting it. So I've really been enjoying these, and I love myself some Byzantine history. Exactly as they said, you know, I don't like the Byzantine Empire in spite <laughs> of all the trouble it went through. That's why it's so fascinating to me. It is fascinating how an empire that went through so much decline, seemingly so often, so many issues, so, you know, was in a vulnerable position so often, managed to survive for such a long time, and at times managed to thrive. I mean, we talk about the Byzantine Golden Age, we talk about Byzantine cultural influence, even beyond the bounds of its empire. It's truly remarkable stuff. And that's what, you know, in many ways interests me about the Roman Empire as a whole, you know, how it managed to adapt and survive. I mean, look, I'm a fan of all types of Roman history. The Pax Romana is certainly interesting too, but I find Rome most interesting not when it's at its peak, but when it's, you know, going downwards. Um, or it's recovering. That is the really fascinating stuff to me. Uh, anyway, basically, love this video. Uh, you guys can check it out. It's linked down below. Uh, if you guys enjoyed this reaction, please leave a like, subscribe, check out the Patreon, all that good stuff. I hope you guys are having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.